Well, welcome to this lecture. I'm uh, Richard Alston and I'm Professor of Roman History at uh, Royal Holloway in the Classics Department and I teach a range of Roman History courses. What I'm going to be talking to you about in this short section is about Pliny's wife and about love and relationships roughly in the early second century uh, AD. And it's part of a first year course um, which covers Roman history and this is where we delve into the secrets of uh, individual relationships. In understanding individual relationships we're also thinking about the relationship between men and women and in particular because this is the way this is constructed uh, how women are thought about uh, and depicted in Roman society of this period. We do have quite a lot of images of women from, from this time, indeed slightly earlier, and they all form a pretty, fall into a pretty normative sort of system. We get women who are smiling gently, women who have very elaborate hairstyles, women depicted as mothers, women who are disciplined, women who conform to uh, a certain set of moral values or at least appear to are also very normally very heavily clothed covering up their bodies. Now that's in some contrast to the popular depiction of women in of Rome and women from the Roman world which is rather more exotic and rather more um, sexual. So we see uh, women engaged in luxurious languor in 19th century paintings we see the frank depiction of female bodies, and we see the offerings of uh, sex uh, and uh, indeed a certain amount of partying in the weekends of uh, Nero. The problems we have when we start to think about these issues, the problems we're going to be looking at in this material is how do we understand how Romans loved? How do we understand the basis of Roman relationships? And how do we understand the nature of Roman marriage? We could approach this, of course, through legal texts. But what would legal texts tell us about marriage in our own times? What would legal texts tell us about how we love and the basis of our relationships? How do we get into the heart of the Roman family? How do we get into the heart of the conjugal relationships, which must have formed the basis of Roman social values. Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at a set of letters uh, written by Pliny the Younger uh, in the early second century. Pliny the Younger is uh, was a consul in around, well, exactly 100 CE under Trajan, who is depicted here on the right of the screen. He was an author and he's left us 10 books of letters. Those books of letters, first nine books at least, offer his great insight into his social life and his social attitudes and those of his friends. The 10th book is a bit different. It was contained the letters he wrote when he was governor uh, to, uh, tr to Trajan. One of the notable things about those letters, which can occasionally make them seem a little dull, is that Pliny presents himself and his friends as near perfect. They're living in some sort of utopian world where everybody is nice, where everybody is well behaved, and where Pliny himself is a, an ideal man. The other speech is the speech in favour of Trajan from uh, 100. He delivered praising the emperor. Let us take an example. Uh, this is a letter to his wife. Um, Epistle 7.5, remember the number, to his wife Calpurnia. You cannot believe how much I miss you. I love you so much and we are not used to separations. So I stay awake most of the night thinking of you. And by day I find my feet carrying me, a true word carrying, to your room at the times I usually visited you. Then finding it empty I depart, as sick and sorrowful as a lover locked out. The only time I am free from this misery is when I am in court and wearing myself out with my friends' lawsuits. You can judge then what a life I am leading when I find rest in work and distraction in troubles and anxiety. Calpurnia 
is away. Pliny misses him. He pines for her. He lies awake at night, thinking of her. He wanders his house to the rooms where she is staying, and finding them empty, he departs, sick and sorrowful. This is a depiction of conjugal love. Pliny is not alone in talking about his affection for his wife in the literature of this period. Mostly Greek writers also write about relations between husbands and, and wives and emphasise the loving nature of those relationships. And that's rather different from the sorts of literature we get from earlier in the Roman world, where love is often uh, an adulterous love or love is a rather violent sort of uh, engagement. Love between spouses is not something that is stressed in other forms of literature. So historians have tended to see these Pliny's letters and indeed some similar writings as a, a sea change, a sea change in the way in which uh, Romans organized their conjugal relationships. What it meant was that men were investigating, the, investing their time and energy in their private world, in their households, investing in their wives and in their personal happiness. Women also were becoming increasingly prominent in households. And that led to greater levels of equality between men and women. And so it is thought more even romantic relations between social and intellectual and financial equals. But life is not so simple as that. And to investigate some of the complexities, we need to turn to another letter of Pliny. Indeed, the letter before the one we just read in the collection 7-4. In that letter, Pliny is talking about his poetry, it's one of his favourite topics, and thinking about what a great poet he is. Unfortunately, we have very little of Pliny's poetry to assess whether he was any good or not. But judging from this, well, maybe it's not such a loss after all. Anyhow, this is what he includes, includes in one of his letters. When I was reading the books of Gallus, in which he dared to give to his father the palm and glory won from Cicero, I found the wanton games of Cicero, and saw the talent with which he laid aside serious matters, and in which he showed human taste, and much fairy charm, such as pleased the minds of great men. For he complains that Tiro, by wicked tricks, defrauding his lover of the kisses owed to him for a little dinner, has drawn away the hours of darkness. I, reading these, I say, why after this do we hide our loves and fear to speak out and talk of the other Tiro's guile and our Tiro's shy seduction and the intrigues by which he adds new passions? So, in a letter that precedes the letter to his wife, Pliny writes of his love for his male freedman. It's also a very literary letter in which Pliny writes about a poem, in which he writes about a poem, in which the poet writes about a poem, in which they talk about the loves. The love for Tiro, the love of Cicero for Tiro, is paralleled by the love of Pliny for his Tiro 150 years later. What's going on? Let's go back to the letter, 7-5. As we start to think about it, as we start to analyse this letter, we start to see some other things going on. How does Pliny escape his loss? He goes and does his work. He goes to the law courts. Is that really the most romantic thing you can do? Public life trumps private life. Public life trumps the problems of a uh, broken morning heart. And who's in charge here? He stays awake most of the night thinking of the girl, and by day his feet carry her when he normally visits her, not her normally visiting him. He is clearly in charge. And then there's this weird thing. He departs as sick and sorrowful as a lover locked out. Now, if you've not read any Latin love poetry, you don't know what you're missing. But there is a standard trick in Roman love poetry from the Augustan period, so about a century earlier, in which a lover turns up at his uh, girlfriend's house 
and complains to the door that the door won't let him in. In that, we have a situation in which the girl, the object of desire, is in somebody else's house, presumably her husband. And it's sick and sorrowful, the lover has to go because the husband is, surprisingly, not letting him in. But in Pliny's case, Pliny owns the door. The girl, Cornelia, is in his house. If this is a power game, he has all the power. And so he can't depart as sick and sorrowful as a lover locked out. And the very literariness of this illusion suggests that what we're talking about here is not a real relationship, but a game, a contrivance, a way of showing off his literariness and his romance in his literature, very much as the previous poem, a previous poem, previous letter would have us believe. Well, there are quite a lot of letters uh, to about Calpurnia. Um, she is, appears in book four, uh, letters we saw were in book seven, and we'll have a quick look at, at one of them. This is a letter to Calpurnia Hispula, uh, the aunt of Calpurnia, Pliny's wife. He's writing back to say how well good the relationship has been. So it's, the relationship is introduced in book four, so they're newly, uh, newly um, married. I know then how glad you will be to hear that she has proved herself worthy of her father and her grandfather and you. Well, that's romantic. Um, the way in which uh, he praises his wife is that she is worthy of her father and grandfather. What else does she do? This love has given her an interest in literature. She keeps copies of my works to read again and again, and even learn by heart. Now, in a modern context, of course, one just laughs at that. But here is this girl in Pliny's house, desperate to learn why he spends all his time writing and then learns his literature. The killer, though, is in the second paragraph. She does not love me for my present age, nor my person, which will gradually grow old and decay, but for my aspirations to fame. Nor would any other feelings be suitable for one brought up by your hands and trained in your precepts, who has only seen what was pure and moral in your company and learned to love me on your recommendation. Why does Calpurnia love Pliny? Because she was told to. Why does she love him? Not because of any physical attraction, but because of his literature, because of his aspirations to fame. Who is in charge here? Who has the power? Who is important? Who is reduced in this relationship? And then we come to rather an interesting problem. How old are they? Well, book four of Pliny's letters, we can't date it very exactly, is probably written about 104, maybe 105. And Pliny, we know, is born around 61 to 62. So he's 43, that sort of age. Calpurnia is more difficult to, to date. Calpurnia's aunt is a young friend of Pliny's mother and a friend to Pliny, which suggests maybe a bit older than Pliny, but not very much. Calpurnia in book eight, so even after this point, probably about 107, miscarries. And in the two letters in which Pliny reports the miscarriage, he says that, in one of them, that she is too young to know what is happening. So here is a woman who has been married for maybe three, four years um, and presumably engaged in sexual relations during that period. Um, yet she is too young to know that she might be pregnant or too young to detect the signs of pregnancy. How old is she then in 107? And by that time, She's been married for three years. The youngest a Roman woman can get married is 13. Are we looking then at a girl who in 107, when she miscarries, miscarries 16, 17? In which case, she's marrying a man in his 40s 
when she is 13 or 14. Our Pliny should, in our modern society, spend most of his life in jail. So what do we conclude? We start to think about uh, love and marriage, when you start to think about the conjugality, when we start to think about the uh, love letters that we see, we have to rethink because there are certain attitudes here, certain power relations, which seem uncomfortable to say the least. Throughout the letters, throughout those books of letters, Calpurnia says not a word. We never have any report of her writing to her family. She speaks only through Pliny. She sings Pliny's poems. She loves because she is told to love. She loves because it is her duty. Pliny's close relationship is with Fabatus, the grandfather, and his Hispula, the aunt. And they're clearly family friends that goes with, with a friendship that goes back over several generations. They're clearly both local families from North Italy. And it's also clear that what this marriage is doing is making the next generation, it's making the next little Pliny, the next little Fabatus, who will go on to great things. The marriage is not about love, the marriage is about business. And this is where we start to see some of the differences between our modern and the ancient, particularly Roman, attitudes. What is crucial here is marriage is social reproduction. Marriage is about making new households. It is not about love. It is not about romantic attachment. Romantic attachment is an extra. For us, it is romance. For them, it is business. And yet, love had its dangers. And the Romans were particularly aware of those. They had their love poetry. They had their poetry in which people gave over themselves into love, into its successes, into its transformatory capabilities. Love was a danger because love had the capacity to upset business. And thank you. And in a minute, it will be good night.